Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Christopher Hurtado. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our hope is that as we discuss the scriptures, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are doing chapters 21 through 34 in Exodus. Now, the actual reading in the manual has us doing, I think, like chapter 24. Four and then like 31 through 34, if I remember right. But you know me and Christopher, we don't like to skip chapters, so we're still going to talk at least a little bit about the section as a whole to make sure that we don't miss any context here. This could get us in trouble in Leviticus. We'll cross that bridge when we find (laughs) it. Yeah, we've already started talking about how we were going to do Leviticus, but that's put on a back burner for the moment. We'll have to revisit that discussion. (laughs) So here in these chapters, we have a continuation of the law given to Moses. Basically, we start getting into some nitty-gritty stuff here of the particulars. And what I see going on here is basically we have an assortment of these common laws that arose among the people over time. And what it looks like to me is that they were subsequently incorporated into the narrative and deemed as the word of the Lord. And I can see that happening because Israel sees themselves as the chosen people. And so any of their laws are going to be considered ordained by God. So it makes sense when you're writing this and putting together all of these traditions that establish this founding narrative and myth for the people that all of the laws become codified as ordained and given directly from God. But these actually read much more like common laws among the people, except for some interesting little exceptions. They're very similar to other legal codes and law collections within the ancient world. And so they really fit well within that context. So a couple of those interesting general exceptions that are going on here would be laws that deal with the disadvantaged. In particular, we have laws that deal with slaves. Now, In these chapters, people having slaves is just, you know, a foregone conclusion, right? The verse straight up says, you know, verse 2 of chapter 21, when you buy a male Hebrew slave, right? Not if, but when. (laughs) Right. And so the assumption is that this is just a fact of the culture, of society, and of life. And then it starts putting stipulations on how slaves are to be treated and when they're to be set free and things like that. And these types of things were used for many centuries as justifications for the institution of slavery. Despite that, when we go back to the ancient context of these, we do see quite a bit of, let's say, improvement or the way that this treats slave is better than average for the ancient world, right? Without justifying slavery in any way, you know, there is some sort of an improvement going on here in the legal code with regards to slaves. Then in general, when we step back and look at all of this, there is what has been termed basically a concern for the disadvantaged in general. And this appears repeatedly throughout the five books of Moses. These types of concerns in particular with slaves or women, the poor or disadvantaged, these kinds of considerations really don't exist in this way in other ancient Near Eastern law collections. So they do stand out as something somewhat unique to the Hebrew legal tradition, if we want to call it that. But the Torah, as a law collection, fits in the context of the ancient world and the ancient mindset. So the next part of this section of reading, after we kind of go through some of these laws and the the nitty gritty of it, we get to the Lord giving the instructions on how to build and furnish the tabernacle. And these get really, really detailed. Like, I remember reading this, but it's been a long time since I read this, and I had forgotten how, like, 
really detailed and you know this kind of drags on as you're reading through all of this description of exactly how to do this it did remind me a bit and i think this is you know totally the idea and the point when in the doctrine and covenants when the lord gives commandment to joseph smith to build the temple there is sort of this explanation about exactly how big it is and how exactly how it's supposed to be built so it's very detailed so it's quite a specific allusion to this here in Exodus, where the Lord is very detailed about how the tabernacle is to be constructed, exactly what it's to be constructed of, the exact dimensions, and all that kind of stuff. The next part we come to after that is the incident with the golden calf, which there's there's a lot of stuff going on there, and a lot of strange stuff going on there. Some of it we can kind of decode a little bit. Some of it I'm not so sure we have any decryption keys for. <laughs> I don't think anybody does. Yeah, it, it, it's just kind of strange. What did PDN say? How rude of them not to realize we were going to be reading this millennia later and wouldn't have the context for it. Yes. Yeah. Something like that. Like, why didn't they think of these people several millennia later that were going to be reading this and didn't know what they were talking about? You know. <laughs> so yeah, really good point. After that incident, it's kind of divided up in these two parts. The, the next part we get is how to clothe and wash and anoint the priests that are going to be serving in the tabernacle. And so we have the construction of the tabernacle itself, the golden calf incident, and then the clothing and washing anointing of the priests, specifically Aaron is who it talks about in this instance, to serve within the tabernacle. So we'll kind of talk about the structure of that narrative and how that goes through. And all of this to get the children of Israel in a mode of obedience and purity and preparedness to enter into the promised land, right? Into that sacred, that holy space, meaning set apart, right? That is set apart for them. Well, remember, they've been Been, in Egypt for 420 years, it says, right? And so this is trying to completely shift their mindset to worshiping a different god, right? And so first God shows his power, and now he's delivering his modes to them so that they can finally leave behind all the modes of Egypt and focus on the modes of the Lord. And that's kind of what is going on here, is that they either aren't ready or don't know how to do that, or they kind of try and fail. And so there's a lot of themes there. You make a good point, Ben, because the most important thing that I think you see that really stands out about how they're to worship is that it's not like the Canaanites. So all these details that we're talking about that we see here, they matter because it's done differently than the Canaanites. First, forget everything you know. (laughs) Right. Right. Ben, is this a good time to go back? And you said something about the nitty gritty. And I was thinking about how we got the the Decalogue, right? The 10 words that we call the 10 commandments. And I remember you saying last time, these weren't really laws. So they're sort of casuistic law and apodeictic law. The way they're formulated, yeah, aren't like laws. Yeah, they're not like casuistic law where it's like case law where like, if this, then that. There's apodeictic law and they are like that where it's just like, do this, don't do that, right? So there's that kind of thing. But then after the 10 commandments or the Decalogue, you get this book of the covenant, something like that. I don't know the exact chapters. I don't know if you want to bring that in, but this is, you know, what follows. And so some have interpreted this, when you said nitty gritty, this is probably not what you meant, but it made me think of this. Some have interpreted this as now we're going to explain out these 10 commandments and go into detail. But the problem is that doesn't really work because not all the things are actually mentioned. And in fact, what we actually see is, as we've said many times before, evidence for the documentary hypothesis Mm -hmm. that there's just different traditions that are woven together. Another thing I wanted to say is about slavery. Yes, in this narrative, we get something about slavery that should not have been used and should not be used still to justify slavery today or even in early American history at any other time. But rather, we see something that is better than what there was around these ancient people at the time. And we can also see if we move forward to Deuteronomy and eventually to Leviticus that it actually gets more and more liberal and that the concern for what we would think of as the right way to deal with the issue of slavery becomes greater and greater and greater, you know, something closer and closer and closer to justice. So to give an example, a concrete example, here a male slave can be freed, but a female slave cannot. Later on, a male and female slave can be freed in Deuteronomy. And then in Leviticus, you can't even have a slave. 
So we see some progress in that way. And we also see some some contradictions in some sense, looking at the different versions of the Decalogue itself shows up again later on in the text at the end of Moses' life. He's going back over this. What is it? Deuteronomy chapter 5? And things don't match up exactly. Yeah. And, you know, one of the thoughts that came to me, Christopher, I don't think we brought this up last time. I know I mentioned it a little bit, but I was realizing after we recorded the podcast last week that the actual structure and format of Moses sitting down with the people and then, you know, receiving the Ten Commandments and then teaching them and then the Lord giving them all this, what I call the nitty gritty, actually is a very similar outline to the Sermon on the Mount. Like, I can see how Matthew, in writing those chapters, like five through seven, would have used potentially this narrative as a structure by which to then present the Sermon on the Mount to say, just like Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it been said, but I say, right? And so it was kind of like Jesus fulfilling the law. And so when he says, you know, love God, love your neighbor. This is the law and the prophets. When he goes through and he says, you have heard it hath been said, don't kill, but I say. And so this is all sort of a commentary, if you will. But, you know, it's by Matthew, Jesus calls this the fulfillment of the law. And so there's a lot of things in this that are very closely tied together between these two narratives of the Sermon on the Mount and this point in Exodus where we have Moses giving the law to the people. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I think back to my experience of studying Matthew when the Come Follow Me curriculum took us through the New Testament, and two things really stood out to me in reading Matthew. Number one, he really knows his Greek rhetoric in terms of his rhetorical ability. And number two, and maybe I should have said these in opposite order, he really knows his Old Testament. Right. I felt like I have no business reading the New Testament because I don't know the Old Testament. And so I was waiting for this. And I know Shiloh was too. Shiloh wanted to do this. And now he's not doing it. I'm doing it. So I'm happy to be here doing this and really getting to know the context for what Matthew is doing. And so thanks for pointing that out, Ben. Something else we could point out is that when we get the Ten Commandments, we get this sort of suzerain vassal treaty format where God says, this is who I am and this is what I've done for you. And now this is what you're going to do. And it's a given, by the way. And so this is something where a lot of people like to say that the Jews or the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints, right, that we focus on being saved by works rather than by grace. But the reality is God has already delivered the people out of Egypt. That's done. Uh And now he's saying, this is who I am and this is what I've done. And so that's already done. And now you're going to do this to live into this relationship that I have established with you. Yeah. What then becomes interesting about that when you get to the golden calf incident is that the Lord seems to not want the relationship anymore, right? He's ready to throw it all away, flush it down the toilet. (laughs) It's funny you should say flush it down the toilet. I was thinking (laughs) we're we're back to the flood almost again, right? Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Water. (laughs) That's kind of the idea. And there's some interesting statements in there. I guess, you know, we shouldn't jump over this stuff to get to it. So we'll get to it when we get to it. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just to contextualize this, I do think that looking at this as the blueprint structure by which Matthew wrote the Sermon on the Mount is a very, very interesting and helpful way to come at this. It's not a Christological approach because we're not going back to this and reading Christ into it. What we're doing is we're saying, oh, this is how Matthew presented Christ to the Jews. Right. And he used things that they understood already, structure that they understood already, in order to appeal to them. Right. And that's good rhetoric. You know, it reminds me of the Gospel of John, right? I remember reading for the first time last year the play of Euripides, the Bacchae or the Bacchantes. And it was so strange. And how can it not be strange? Because it's about this ancient mystery cult. And by mystery, it means nobody can talk about it, right? Yeah. Mystery means close the the mouth. mouth. And so we don't really know that much about it. And yet there's these strange things are happening in this play around this mystery cult. And so it's very, very strange. And yet I'm having this feeling of familiarity at the same time, which just seems like a contradiction. And then I was just looking for something actually for Shiloh, something unrelated online. And I ran into quite serendipitously 
the source where somebody was saying that the Gospel of John is based on Euripides Bacchae. In other words, just like you're saying, Matthew is speaking to an audience that knows this other ancient text, and so he puts things in those terms. So it's kind of like saying, okay, you know Bacchus. And the audience would say, well, yeah, of course we know Bacchus. Okay, Jesus is just like Bacchus, only he's the real deal. He's better than Bacchus. And so it's sort of modeled, the Gospel of John looks like it's sort of modeled after that. And of course, there are two possible explanations. That's one. If they look alike, then one must have been inspired by the other in some sense. Another explanation sort of goes with Jung's, what does he call it? The collective unconscious, right? That these ideas, they just pop up here and there. If this is the best way to present it, it's right. the best way to present it. And so great minds think alike, right? Exactly. Yeah. Something like that. So both explanations are possible, but the parallels are undeniable. Hmm, yeah. That's interesting. Great play, by the way. So I'm going to delve into a few of the details here that stood out to me. And one of the first ones that comes up here in chapter 21 is over in verses 12 and 13. So I'm going to read these verses in the NRSV, and then I'm going to read them in the KJV because there's an important way that it's translated in the KJV that's important to our Latter-day Saint tradition. So NRSV, this is verses 12 and 13 of chapter 21 of Exodus. Whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. If it was not premeditated, but came about by an act of God, then I will appoint for you a place to which the killer may flee. Okay, so here's the KJV, the King James Version of those verses. He that smiteth a man so that he dies shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. Okay, so this phrase here, God deliver him into his hand, this is basically the exact words that are used in 1 Nephi chapter 4 when Nephi is about to kill Laban. And this is one of the justifications, reasons, that is given to Nephi for why it's okay for him to kill Laban. because. Let me go read the verses. Given, given for Nephi or given by Nephi? Given to Nephi. And in the narrative, it's the spirit that's giving these reasons to Nephi. Over here, it says it several times, but I'm going to go to 1 Nephi chapter 4, verse 12. And it came to pass that the spirit said unto me again, Slay him, for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Okay, There it is. Yeah, and there it is. So this is actually the words, again, that tell Nephi, okay, the Lord has delivered him into my hands, and so it's okay for me to kill him. Also, earlier in this verse, it says, if a man lie not in wait. And the NRSV helps us a little bit here with better modern English. It says, if it was not premeditated, but came about by an act of God. Okay, so what does Nephi say in chapter 4, verse 6? I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. So no already Nephi, at the beginning of this narrative, is saying, I didn't plan on killing him. This wasn't premeditated. I didn't, you know, lie in wait for this to happen. God delivered him into my hands, right? So I yeah. killed him. And then what happens? The verse says, I will appoint for you a place to which the killer may flee. Nephi leaves Jerusalem, right? He's exiled. And so this all kind of follows this pattern outlined in these verses here. Not necessarily this specifically, but there's other things surrounding this incident of Nephi that have been cited as Nephi conforming to the law of Moses. Now, I'm not going to spend the time on getting into the whole Nephi thing because that's a whole podcast in and of itself. And we have talked about it a little bit in previous podcasts. And when we come back around to the Book of Mormon, we'll get to that again in a couple of years. Inshallah. Inshallah. God willing. Yeah. So I thought that was a really interesting point to bring out from this chapter because it is so prominent, you know, front and center within Latter-day Saint tradition. Yeah. We'll have to wait to talk about Nephi until we get there, right? But this is one example where he looks like he really is justifying himself or putting himself in a certain pattern is what we can see. Yeah, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have more to say about that. Oh, there's so much there. I mean, we did mention how Nephi tells his story in the pattern of the Davidic kingship and how his killing of Laban was analogous to the killing of Goliath by David. And right. so that's a way that it justifies Nephi's kingship. So 
I said we weren't going to get into it, and then there it is. Well, you're, you're just it. mentioning <laughs> just mentioning the topic, right? And to mention yeah. another one, there's even the possibility that that he didn't kill Laban, that he just yeah. tells a story in a certain way to justify his kingship. I remember mentioning this to someone who said, Nephi wasn't a king. And I thought, are you kidding me? He was Every first, king yeah. after Nephi was named Nephi for yeah. being king, right? And so, yeah, that's another possibility. Yeah, it is. So, like I said, there's a lot more that can go into with details in that story where we can kind of pull that stuff out. But Stay we'll tuned. get to it when we do. Yeah. <laughs> So for me, the next thing comes up in chapter 23. So that is skipping a bit of stuff here. Christopher, you know, my commentary on these chapters and what I call the nitty gritty of what to do if your ox kills somebody and, you know, all these different things that happen, these all boil down to these common laws and love thy neighbor, right? I'd like to say something before you move on in a general sense about that. And then actually go into one thing in yeah. Exodus 22, just one thing. So generally speaking, since you brought up my oxen wandering over into somebody else's field and things like that, these aren't issues that pertain to me. Right? And this is casuistic law, and it's really hard to take case law from an ancient context and bring it into our context. And even the apodictic stuff doesn't necessarily come over in that way. And so it's interesting that people think that, you know, in the Judaic tradition, that they're just sort of focused on law and they're legalistic and the letter of the law and whatnot, when in reality, what they've done all along in the tradition and what we have to do as Christians, just the same, is to try to figure out how to adapt these ideas to get at the principles, what an Islamic law, for example, would be called maqasid al-sharia, the purposes or the intention of the law, what is it for? And so getting at those principles, those legal principles, this is what you would call philosophy of law or jurisprudence. And so this is what the whole Halakha tradition does. And that word that's used in Judaism for that tradition, it means walking. Can I call it the covenant path? You know, I mean, it's not the necessarily way. about covenants, but it's the way, right? There you go. It's the way, the path, right? It's a path where you walk with God and you sort of wrestle with God, as Jacob did, right? And as the rabbinic tradition has always done and sort of try to figure out how to be obedient to God in your own context. Now, I did want to say something about Exodus 22, and that is that it's kind of uncomfortable for us, but hopefully it's uncomfortable for both men and women, but it's going to be uncomfortable for women. We get that right after something happens to your animals and you get compensated for it, if something happens to your daughter, then you get compensated for that too. I remember one of the commentators we read pointing out that in some English translation, it doesn't happen in our King James Bibles and our Latter-day Saint scriptures, but some English translations try to insert a sort of a, a heading here to kind of give the impression that we've talked about a property above and now we're talking about daughters. But in reality, the daughters just show up right after the oxen as property. And it kind of reminded me of Rachel and Leah again. So this is a whole different context than ours. And we have to be able to take this and bring it into our own context. We have to figure out how to be obedient. The other thing is we don't get instructions of it. So keep the Sabbath holy. Okay. And by the way, you'll be put to death if you don't. Great. How do I do that? What exactly does that mean? And so you can see in the Judaic tradition that they are trying to work this out. And there's a lot of commentary, a lot of Midrash done. I know a little bit about the philosophy of law, and generally the idea that comes out of this is that when we're talking about common law especially, the tendency of common law is to evolve in the direction of reducing conflict within a society. And so whatever laws arise within a society that are going to generally help the people have less conflict between them those are the laws that kind of make their way through the system and right. come out the other end. And I thought that was an interesting juxtaposition against what Jesus says about the law and the prophets, right? He says, love God and love thy neighbor. We can look at common law as a way of reducing conflict. When we look at what Jesus says about this and he says, love thy neighbor, that encompasses reducing conflict, right? But it's so much more. It fulfills that law and then brings us to a higher one. And so it's an interesting way of looking at the general principles here, like you were saying, Christopher, of reducing conflict. And then, like I said, when Jesus comes along, he fulfills that and then gives the entire point of this isn't just to reduce conflict, it's to help you learn how to love your neighbor. Yeah, it's a really good point. 
you know, we've pointed out that the laws that the ancient Israelites have, that they actually look a lot like those of their neighbors. We have, thanks to archaeology for a couple hundred years now, we've known about laws of surrounding peoples all the way back to, what, 3rd millennium B.C. up to mm. 700 B.C. And one of the most familiar to people is the Code of Hammurabi, right? Yes. And it actually includes the very famous an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is another thing that's been misunderstood, I think, is the idea that it just has like this vengeful feel to it, is how we read it, how we misread it, that is. And really what it's saying is, and there's, I can't remember where, but we actually get into, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and this for this and that for that. What it's really doing is it's making sure that the punishment is commensurate with the crime, with the transgression, so that it's no greater than or lesser than, but commensurate, right? So it's not really about revenge. It's not like whatever you do, the punishment is death, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Even though we see that a little bit here, right? You know, like if you disrespect your parents, you die. If you break the Sabbath day, you die, you know? Okay. So along these lines, I'm going to go to a verse in chapter 23, verse five, it says, When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help to set it free. And this stood out to me because reading through all of these things, right, it was all about, you know, what's just, and like you said, eye for an eye type of thing, you know, it's very tit for tat, justice type thing. And this verse kind of pops out at you as mercy, right? This kind of pops out at me as very Sermon on the Mountish, that you would love your enemies. The donkey of the person that hates you, well, you know, if they hate you, then they deserve whatever's coming to them. And that must mean that whatever happens to their donkey, that's just, right? But in this, it's actually advocating something different. And that in the middle of all this jumps out. So the next thing for me comes in chapter 24. So we're transitioning to a new section here. So we've got all of these laws spelled out, and now we're kind of moving the narrative forward. And here in the narrative, Moses goes back up on Sinai, but this time he takes people with him. It says he takes Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they go up and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. So here we have a statement of an actual theophany that isn't just Moses, but we have 73 other people actually seeing God. And then it becomes anthropomorphized here, where they see his feet standing on something and they see him. Now, in the ancient tradition and mindset, if you see God, you will die. Right. So there's going to be this moment where they're going to be surprised that they didn't die. And there's always that moment of surprise for the people. And yet it seems to be a repeating theme throughout the scripture whenever they see God and then they're surprised that they didn't die. Even so, sometimes when you read some of the commentary on this, the commentary does say, well, they didn't actually see God. What they're saying is, you know, They were in the presence of God. And so the statement is, it says, like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven. And so this was all things to sort of try to describe the experience, but they didn't actually see God. So I don't know exactly how that comes about, how you explain that away in the text. I mean, the text does say they saw God. It does. You know, for a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters, God can't have a body And for Latter-day Saints, we've got God in a pine box, right? Because he's in a body and we can fit him in a pine box now. And so they're going to look at anthropomorphisms and explain them away. We're going to look at anthropomorphisms and jump up and down. And we probably both need to come somewhere in the middle. There's something more to both of those, right? Neither one of those hits it on the head. And be open to... I think, again, when we have something all figured out, we're not open to learning. So if we think we have it all figured out, And it's a tendency that we have as Americans in general, as Latter-day Saints in particular, we want to have the right answer. And we don't have the training, you know, and our education doesn't include the kind of nuance that, say, a European education has. We're not philosophers, right? Mm. I am, but most Americans are not philosophers. 
And maybe if anything, we're, we're pragmatists. You know, that's the only philosophy America ever produced was pragmatism. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah, that's a good point. So after this, Moses comes down off the mountain with these two tablets, right? And this is a very iconic picture in your mind. Like probably everybody knows the Charlton Heston. We even have paintings of it. Big bearded Moses with the red overcoat. And he's got these stone tablets, one in each arm. And, you know, five commandments are on one and five commandments are on the other. Or there's or six and know, four, maybe. Yeah, six and four, maybe because they're divided up into, you know, God and neighbor, right? And actually, in some of the commentary, I thought this was a way better explanation. The reason yeah. there are two isn't because, you know, you can't fit all the Ten Commandments on one. The reason there are two is because this is a covenant between God and the people. It's a treaty. It's a contract. And even then, contracts were done in duplicate because each side needed a copy. And so the idea is that there's two here, and it's a representation of the fact that God really is making a binding contract covenant with these people. You know, today we have, well, we don't anymore, but something like a carbon copy, right? Well, today you just print right. off two copies and you sign them both. Now, the text doesn't tell us anything about this, right? This is conjecture, but it's sure. good conjecture. So presumably God's copy goes in the ark, right? And then the other copy, I don't know where that goes. <laughs> Probably in the ark well, too, right? A different yeah, the, way? I the don't know. narrative's a little bit fuzzy on some of the things. So Moses, when he comes down and sees the golden calf, right, he throws the tablets down and they break. Oh, yeah. And so then he goes back up and God's like, oh, okay, you broke those. I'll give you some new ones. <laughs> yeah, eventually in another chapter, we get the second edition of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And so I feel bad, but I'm not exactly clear. I believe the broken fragments go inside the ark. And then the new ones, I guess, do as well. Okay. I'm not exactly sure the origin of this, but there is a Latter-day Saint tradition commentary on this that the first tablets were a higher law. And when Moses came down and saw that they were building the golden calf, he broke that and then he went back up and God gave him the lower law. And so this is sort of a, a Latter-day Saint commentary. I don't know the origin of it. But, you know, it was kind of an interesting thought. Yeah, it sounds Latter-day Saints. Sounds so, very Mormon-y, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Another thing, Ben, that we should point out, I think, is, you know, not only is it, there's not two copies because there's the religious and the secular law. That kind of division doesn't work. And one of the evidences that we see in the text is later on when we get, when they, they come, sometimes English words fail me, intercalados. Intercalados, that would be... So colado would be glued, so like collated? Intercolate, yeah. So yeah, they're collated, right? That's it, yeah. So they, they alternate, right? They alternate between secular, religious, secular, religious, secular, religious, something like that. And so that kind of separating them in that way doesn't really work. So that's a good explanation, I think. You know, the two copies, that makes sense. It is interesting to note that when he comes down and are we going into the golden calf now? Can we go into that? It's not quite time for that. Not quite. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off then. Because you said he broke the tablets, right? That's, that's yes. when that happens. Yeah. He hasn't broken them yet. I think Pete Enns goes into this, but it's unclear where Moses is in the story when God is talking to him sometimes. Like sometimes he's up on the up mountain too, yeah. and sometimes he's down. And one of the possible explanations here is that this is just another evidence of the documentary hypothesis. But certainly God can talk to Moses anywhere. The idea is that he's talking to him in the mountain, but, you know, certainly right. God can talk to him elsewhere. Yeah, but Pete Enns gave us this assignment, if you will. We'll pass it on from Pete Enns <laughs> yeah. from the Bible for normal people. When you read through these chapters, see if you can figure out where Moses is. Because he goes up. Like, where's Waldo? <laughs> exactly. Where's Moses? So again, do you see him go up without coming down or is he down? Is he up? Where is he? Right. So this can be evidence of sort of different versions of the story collated. So what we have here next in chapter 25 is the Lord giving to Moses the blueprints and architectural plans of how the tabernacle is to be built. Exactly the materials, exactly the dimensions. And everything. And there's a lot to this symbolically, obviously. Every single thing has a very specific and even elaborate symbolic meaning to it. In general, what we're talking about here is a couple things. One, it's a recreation of the circumstances or presence of God on the mount. We're bringing it into the tabernacle that's supposed to be in the midst of the people. 
This is God's mobile home. Yeah, this is God's mobile home, right? And if it's for God, then it better be the best of the best of the best. And so when you read through the materials, it's all the best stuff that's possible. And we'll talk about that point specifically in a little bit. But so all the materials are going to be all of the best of the best of the best. The idea here is that this is God's abode, his place to dwell among his people. It's also the construction of a palace for the king, and God is their king, right? And so everything is going to be the best. There is a progression here of sacred space, and this becomes symbolized not just within the dimensional construction of the tabernacle, where you have the outer, and then the court, and then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. That's a spatial sacred space. But it also becomes symbolized within the materials themselves, where in sort of the outer area, things are done in bronze. And then as you move in, there's silver, and then everything is like solid gold right at the mercy seat on the ark. And so we have this gold, silver, bronze, which this concept of gold, silver, bronze survives till today. Right? That's what we have in the Olympics, gold, silver, bronze, first, second, third, right? That's what I was thinking when you said gold, silver, bronze. Yeah. Yeah, we still conceptualize of these three as first, second, third, right? And so this is what in Latter Saint tradition we call celestial, terrestrial, telestial within our temple experience. So that's kind of what's going on here. This is this abode for God or palace for the king. But then secondly, this is a return to Eden. This is their oasis in the desert, which (laughs) they don't have one, right? And so they create their own mobile oasis so to speak this is their garden and they put a lot of things in it that are symbolic of that including cherubim that guard or cherubim yeah cherubims okay yeah you want to talk about it Christopher? <laughs> well i wanted to you know i've made fun of, of shiloh for saying cherubims when cherubim is plural and it turns out the king james version says cherubims i didn't realize that and so i don't know whether the king james scholars did that surely they knew cherubim was plural in hebrew but they may have done that for the sake of the English reader, or maybe some scribes did it. I don't know. Somebody added an S so that we'd know that this is plural when it isn't obvious. By the way, these aren't chubby little angels. You know, these are a little more scary than that. These are the cherubim that guard the way of the tree of life. So Shiloh, I apologize for making fun of you. <laughs> yeah, so in King James Version, it says cherubims. And like you said, that's possible that the translators put that in there so that we know it's plural. The English plural of cherub is just cherubs. The Hebrew plural of cherub is cherubim, and so cherubims isn't really a word. So going back to the idea, right, this is Eden. This is a return to, or a recreation of Eden, and it all makes sense within our temple tradition as well, right? We have this conception of the washings and anointings and preparation going through the glories arriving, and the Garden of Eden narrative is part of the whole thing. We pull a lot of the practices and symbolism for our temple from this here. There is a commentary on some of the verses here that I want to read about temples going along with what we've just been talking about. So where are you reading from, Ben? This is some commentary within my New Oxford Annotated Bible of the NRSV. Okay, the study Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the study Bible that's the New Oxford Annotated. Okay, so here's the commentary on the tabernacle. It says, unlike religious edifices today, which are places that people enter to worship, temples and shrines in the ancient world were considered earthly residences for deities and were off limits for most humans. They were costly, well-furnished structures befitting their divine occupants. A modest tent shrine, perhaps reflected in the term tent of meaning, that's found in chapter 27, uh, verse 21, may have existed in early Israel, but the elaborate and costly Exodus tabernacle is likely a virtual structure based somewhat on knowledge of the later Jerusalem temple. Like Mount Sinai and the Jerusalem temple, the portable wilderness shrine has three zones of sanctity. Okay, those were symbolized by not just the spaces, but the gold, silver, bronze. Okay, so a few things to discuss about this here. The idea here is that the actual historical tabernacle, not necessarily the one described here in Scripture, but if we were to get in a time machine and go back in time to this period 
and get out and walk around and see what they actually made probably was something much humbler and much simpler. And what we're seeing here is a foreshadowing of what the temple would be when they get to Jerusalem. And then what they do in this narrative is they go back and they apply all of the fine workmanship and best of the best of the best materials to that tabernacle in the past. But the likelihood that all of these materials would have been available to them at this time, you know, in the desert, probably not very likely. I mean, we do know that they took a lot of stuff out of Egypt, so I guess it's possible but yeah, it, let me say something yeah. about that, because, you know, I remember thinking back in Genesis when we were told in advance that when you leave Egypt, you'll take all this gold with you. I thought that was really strange. And then when it happened, I thought it was really strange that they could actually do that. <laughs> Despite the plagues, so-called these pestilences, I still thought it was strange that they could actually do this. And now we get to Exodus and it turns out they need all this gold. And Genesis is written later, and now I get it, right? But at the same time, it would struck me, it really stood out in studying for this podcast, you know, Pete Enns actually said, where did they get all the gold? And I thought, well, isn't that explained as I just explained it? And so I guess apparently that isn't enough of an explanation for, at least for Pete Enns. And that really surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, either they really did get the gold or it's a later explanation of why they're saying there is gold. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember telling you in one of our discussions leading up to this recording, I hope they don't run into any highwaymen, you know, <laughs> because they're wandering around in the desert with a lot of gold. Yeah, they're loaded. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this idea makes sense that they don't necessarily have this as it's described, wandering around. They had something. They probably yeah. had something, right? Yeah. Probably something a lot simpler. And then as, you know, when this is written later on in the context that they have the temple then it's sort of projected backwards in that way. Yeah. That makes sense. I am really reference the Book of Mormon quite a bit because there's a lot of these little things that come out to me. But there's a point where Nephi talks in the Book of Mormon about his building of the temple and that he builds it after the manner of the Temple of Solomon. But he says he doesn't use as many precious things because they weren't to be found in the land. And so I just thought that was interesting. You know, the Nephi is trying to approximate. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Nephi as well is trying to approximate that temple that he saw the best materials that he has. Yeah, either he should have been in Sinai where all these materials are available, (laughs) or at least he should have gone out of Egypt where he could have taken them all with him. Yeah. It's just kind of hard to believe, you know? Yeah. Well, it does say that, you know, Lee and his family left most of their gold and stuff behind because remember they took it to Laban to try to get the And then Laban robbed him. So that's right. They couldn't take any of it with them. (laughs) The next thing for me in this description here, right? Lots of real specific details about the materials and how it's supposed to be constructed and crafted. We get towards the end of chapter 25 and it starts talking about the lampstand. And there's a lot of terminology that is botanical in nature, right? So like we get things like branches and blossoms and petals and calyxes, whatever calyxes are. I'd have to look that up. But it's something related to trees or plants. And so this lampstand, remember this is in the holy place and it's a pure gold. This is a representation of trees or potentially the tree of life itself. Ben, this is too fun not to bring up. Okay, Mm. so I looked up calyx for you. Okay. It is a botany term. Let me explain the sepals of a flower. Oh, perfect. Aren't, aren't you glad we cleared that up for you? Yeah. Forming a whorl, that's W-H-O-R-L, that encloses the petals and forms a protective layer around a flower and bud. If you're a botanist, please reach out to us and tell us what this means. <laughs> yeah, because we're going to have to keep looking up definitions. <laughs> but it is a botanical term, to your point. So this could be what we would reference back to an Edenic type of space and a tree of life. So this is what you like, Christopher. This is a sacred tree, right, in this space here, which evokes divine feminine sort of illusions and you know all, all the other stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, I'll tell you another thing, you know, that stood out to me is the idea that the temple veil is woven from blue, purple, crimson, and white thread. Yeah. And embroidered with cherubim. It sort of brings to mind the expanse of the heavens, right? Yeah, the firmament above, right? The firmament, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. As you look up. 
So all all creation and garden themes, right? This is all throwing back to Genesis one and two, and you know further validates what we were talking about there of those as temple texts, right? These are very much related to each other. That yes. narrative and that story of creation and the garden are very much related to temple themes. They're one and the same. I don't think that I had a whole lot more to say on any specifics until we get to chapter 28. So I'm not sure if you had anything in there. No, I don't I don't really have anything, you know, that I want to bring out. We're, we're coming up on an hour here. We can move on. Okay. So one little blurb out of chapter 28 that I want to mention is the reference to the Urim and Thummim. Okay. So in this story, the Urim and Thummim are basically two little stones or pebbles, and they're kept in a pouch. They didn't have a hat. Yeah, some sort of pouch. Yeah, they didn't have a hat. That's a good one. A, a little pouch. And in this scenario here, the Urim and Thummim aren't seer stones like Joseph Smith describes them. You don't look through them. What they're used for in this scenario is basically like ancient dice, right? These are lots that you cast. And depending on how they land, it helps you do divination. Now, this seems like a very occult practice to us in our like modern conceptualization of religious practice, but this is a very ancient standard thing to divine God's will or the reality of things by casting lots. In fact, you know, it shows up even in the story. I keep referencing Nephi, but in the story of Nephi, when they cast lots to decide who goes to talk with Laban. Yeah, this certainly is part of the ancient worldview. But I have to say, Ben, you know, especially now that I've alluded to Joseph Smith and his seer stone, where he's not casting lots, but he does have his own preferred stone. He ends up setting aside the Urim and Thummim and turning uh -huh. to his seer stone that he's more accustomed to. That ancient magic worldview is very much alive and part of the experience of Joseph Smith's time and place in America. You know, I think of D. Michael Quinn's book, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. And that's well documented in that book. A great book, excellent book. Once upon a time, there was a Latter-day Peace Studies, what was it, a book club or something? I remember going through some books with Shiloh. And one of the books was The Refiner's Fire. And I think it was chosen in some sense. Shiloh's not saying this. This is my analysis. Because it is shorter than the book of D. Michael Quinn, right? I remember when I started reading it, the author made it very clear that he was very much dependent on D. Michael Quinn. And so I thought, well, then why would I read this? <laughs> I'll just read D. Michael Quinn. I'm not scared of a big fat book, right? It, it is quite a, a doorstopper, but mm -hmm. well worth the read. So when we get to this next chapter, chapter 29, this has Moses bringing Aaron and his sons to the tabernacle and washing them and anointing them and putting all of the garments on them. And this is all like very meticulously laid out how these vestments are to be done with Aaron. This is all done symbolically as well in our temple rituals. And this is even quoted. And so people might be familiar as they go through this with some of the words, and then they're going to come across stuff that's like totally different. Like, you know, what is an ephod, right? I'd look it up, Ben, but <laughs> it didn't go well when I looked up calyx. <laughs> So yeah, there's lots of terms in here that are going to be foreign to people, but the general idea and symbolism here might be familiar to people as they read through it and think about modes and rituals to prepare the people for how they're going to understand who God is and come into his presence. I want to give a scripture study tip, Ben. All kidding aside, I don't know my botanical terms, but I do know a lot of words. And, and not just because I'm a hyperpolyglot, but in English, you know, and one of the reasons for that is I actually grew up reading the dictionary. And when I say reading the dictionary, it's not like I read it cover to cover like Malcolm X, who I think is a great example in that regard. He actually copied out the dictionary, you know, but I think what, what I would do is I would go in just like what happened with Calix and you read the definition for Calix and you get whirl and you think, well, what is that? And you have to go look up another word. And I would just end up you know, reading in that way. One word took me to another word, took me to another word. And so I do think it is worthwhile as a scripture study tip to take the time to look up some of these words. If you're not used to looking up words, if you already know this, I'm preaching to the choir. But if, if it's not something you do, take a minute, look up the words. And one of the best resources available to you studying the King James Bible is the Dictionary of Noah Webster from 1828. 
if you can either get a copy or just look it up online if you just google webster 1828 there's an app oh yeah there's an app yeah. too you'll yeah. be able to look up the definition and the reason i recommend that dictionary is because webster completed that work in 1828 the book of mormon was published in 1830 and the book of mormon was written meaning the english is written so that it uses the king james english and that's how the dictionary was made too so words tend to change in their meanings over time and so one of the best ways to look up words when you're studying the Bible is to go back to that dictionary that was created based on the King James Version. Yes, very good advice. Helpful when you're studying any Latter-day Saint scripture as well, Doctrine and Covenants too. Christopher, I think we are to the golden calf. All right, let's do this. I'm excited. Yeah, go for it. Well, okay, so first we have Moses coming down and smashing the tablets. How did we talk about that earlier and we weren't at the golden calf yet, huh? I don't know how I got this job. At any rate, <laughs> he comes down and he finds it, and it's Aaron. Aaron leads them. First of all, Moses has been gone for 40 days and 40 nights. They have no idea what happened to Moses. Is he ever coming back down? By the way, was he up or down? So he's up there, and is he ever coming back? And so they look to Aaron, and Aaron guides them or leads them in creating this golden calf. When we say the golden calf is an idol, we think that means that they're worshiping some other god. When in reality, this calf is a perfectly acceptable in their time and place representation of their God, of Yahweh. But he has told them that he doesn't want them worshiping him via idols. In other words, I don't want you to make this representation. And I love Rob Bell's explanation of this. He says, it's either in What is the Bible or Jesus Wants to Save Christians, both excellent books. He says he wants Israel to be his body. Rob Bell says God's looking for a body. And so he wants, think of the body of Christ. Right? Fast forward this to the Christian tradition. The idea of being a Christian and not taking upon ourselves the name of the Lord in vain is that when someone sees us, they see an example, a Christ-like example, right? So God is looking for a body. He wants to marry us. He wants us to embody him. And by the way, this, this doesn't go well, because remember, we're, we're getting this law, and we didn't mention this already, Ben, but if you don't like reading law, the rest of the Pentateuch is, is going to be a slog for you. But it's embedded in a narrative, as Ben pointed out, and that makes it a little more fun, right? So hang in there, and we'll go through it with you. Ben and I, you know, I have to say, we really kind of hit a wall with this week's reading, right, Ben? Oof. Boy, you know, this is, I wrote to you, Ben. It's I tough said, to read. This is the old, yeah, I said, this is the Old Testament that we were intimidated by going into this. And we kind of forgot about that because it's been kind of fun and easy to some degree. And this week it wasn't. And so this is the Old Testament that we either were or at least should have been intimidated by. So at any rate, we have this narrative. We have the laws given through the narrative, you know, kind of blended in. So God doesn't want us to worship him or the ancient Israelites to worship him in the form of an idol. And so that's the issue. Not that it's a calf and that that's somehow other than God. They really think, you know, Moses is gone. What do we do? We're going to go back to what we know. Moses comes down. He pulverizes the calf. Yeah. Dissolves it in water and has them drink the solution, which totally makes sense. <laughs> so bizarre. This is the part. This is the part where we said we have no idea what he's doing. There are some examples in the ancient world where something like this happened, even in the Bible. Do you remember, Ben, there's something else that happens in the Bible where there are two things that could be going on? Yeah, here. it's later. I don't remember the specific story, but they go and they demolish some other gods of their enemies. They pulverize them and scatter them around or That's something. That's one story, yeah. But I'm not sure if there's one where they ingest it. There's another story where someone ingests it. And so the pulverizing part is obviously about what would be the word? It's about completely destroying this God, yeah, right? Yeah. And then the ingesting it part could have to do with finding out who's responsible for this. Something like that. But the reality yeah. is, look, bottom line is we have no idea. It, like I said, it was very rude, as Pete Enns put it, of the author, not to realize that we'd be reading this millennia later and, and to assume that we would know what he's talking about. He should have given us more detail. It's just strange. You know, it just reminds me, Ben, you and I have studied abroad in the Middle East, right? We already had studied Arabic when we went there. I think about my mother when she went to Morocco. She went to Spain and she crossed over to Morocco. It's the thing to do, right, from Gibraltar. And she came back, and this is long before I studied Arabic and went to study in the Arab world after studying Arabic first. She just went over there without doing any of that. And she just felt like, I am in such a strange place. I can't even begin to comprehend what or how these people are thinking. 
that's how I feel when I look back sometimes at the Old Testament, you know, at the ancient world of the Old Testament. And that's with all my studying. So if you're feeling this way, we feel your pain. And we hope to be able to alleviate some of it here. So I did find one bit of commentary on this that goes along with what you were saying. And because I have no idea really what's going on, it's as good as anything for me, even though I don't know if this is correct. So, but I'll, I'll read it. It says, in this scenario, Moses subjects the people to a trial by ordeal. In other words, those who suffer ill effects from the coerced drinking are considered guilty and are punished. There it is. Finding out who's responsible. Yeah. Again, this is a possibility as to what's going on. That's what some of the commentary seems to say. I think that's as good as any explanation because otherwise I have no idea what's going on. Right. I mean, we don't know. This reminds me of teaching Dante with Travis Patton. Travis and I taught Dante and we'd ask people after we read a canto what they got from it. Whatever you get, and this is true of the Bible, whatever you get when you read it is true for you. It's yours. Take it, keep it, own it, benefit from it, profit from it enjoy it. But sometimes it's not what the author intended. And that doesn't matter in this case, right? And so we'd tell students, you know, that's probably not what Dante intended. But you know, that's still valid for you. And we'd explain what Dante intended. At other times, like in this example here in the Bible, nobody knows what Dante meant. And your guess is as good as the greatest Dante scholar, right? And so that's how it is with this story. It does remind me of something I hear my brother say sometimes, that the scriptures are less important for what they say than what they make you think. Right? Indeed. And I'm reminded once again, Ben, of the discussion you and I had about Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon reading about heaven and hell and getting something that's not there in the text, right? Something that they actually could have found support for somewhere else in the text, the sun, the moon, and the stars. They're reading about heaven and hell, and they get this vision in between the lines. It's what the text the way in which it spoke to them or the way in which it opened up for them this vision of something else. That's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So in this narrative here that you summarize, Christopher, there are these little clues like you talked about that this isn't some other God that they're intending to worship, right? They're trying to figure out how they're supposed to worship Adonai, how they're supposed to worship Jehovah, Yahweh, but they don't no, yet. You know, Moses hasn't given them this, right? He's received it, but he hasn't given it to them yet exactly how they're supposed to go about it. He's given them some things, and some of the things he's given them is don't do what you're going to do. It seems like what's going on here is they kind of become impatient, right? Like, we don't know where Moses is. We don't know if he's ever going to come back and tell us how we're supposed to do all this stuff. We need to move on with this. We need the help of God, and this is the only way we know how to worship. So we're going to make this. And the clues here that they are really trying to worship the God that brought them out of Egypt are what it says. You know, Aaron says, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, something that stood out to me there is it says gods. Yeah, there's only but, one. But like, why does it say gods? I think Pete Enns said, well, this is because this is tied to some other story where it references this. And I, I didn't quite get exactly what he was saying there. But, you know, to me, this seems to still be alluding to the fact that the people are still very much tied to the idea of polytheism, especially in the Egypt tradition. And so even though they understand this idea, they still are looking at plurality of gods and not sure exactly how to approach that. In any case, he then says, tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. In other words, we do know that there's all these gods, right? But tomorrow is going to be a festival just for this one God. So there is this conception that we are supposed to worship this one God, but they haven't quite left behind all the other gods yet. And so even though they have a day for that God, they still have this issue with worshiping other gods beside him, right? You know, I know we have this commandment, thou shalt worship no other gods before me. And I think they're just kind of having some priority issues. So here's what Pete Enns was getting at, Ben, is that, you know, Jeroboam in 1 Kings 12, 26 through 30, cast these two golden calves that are these idols that he installs at the shrines that he builds at Bethel and Dan. And so the idea here is that when this text is written, Exodus, right, it's actually pointing you know, again, this is backwards, right? It's pointing backwards in this way to that story. The Jeroboam story is later, but this is written later. 
And so it can point backwards in that way. It uses the same words terminology. The same way that we have the temple projected backwards in time or the tabernacle okay. in the wilderness, right? Something like that. And so that's possible too. Now, do we get then to where God is going to, he can't actually, there can't be a flood again. Yeah. But he's pretty frustrated. Now, remember, Moses said, let my people go so they can go have this festival, right? They were supposed to celebrate. Yeah. It. And this seems like they're having a festival. But it's not the right festival, and it's not the right time, right? It's not the Lord's way, and it's not in the Lord's time. They jump the gun, so to speak, and Moses hasn't come down, and when he comes down, he finds him. Now God is very displeased that they've done this in this way. And because it sort of subverts all of what brought us to this point in the whole of Exodus, right, up until this point, God just really has to start over, right? And Moses talks him out of it. Yeah, there's kind of an argument that goes on here, and Moses wins the argument with God, and we have this very strange statement here, verse 14, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Or he repented, or he relented, depending on your translation. Yeah, in the KJV, it says the Lord repented or relented, yeah. Yeah. So this poses some theological dilemmas or questions to us, right? Who is this God they're talking about? When we have this conceptualization of God, it's God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't change anything. He's unchanging, right? He's always the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a central pillar to our conceptualization of God. And yet we have this statement here where God is going to completely destroy the people. And Moses says, yeah, but you know, You'll look bad to all the other gods if you right. do that, because you made a promise to these people that you said you wouldn't break, and now you're going to destroy them. And, you know, you won't look like you're such a cool god anymore, like you did when you got us out of Egypt. So right. you can't do this. Um, it's going to ruin your reputation. So you got to figure out another way here. <laughs> yeah, and this isn't the first time that God repents. This is, again, back to Noah, sure. right? Back to the flood yeah. story. He yeah. repented, that he, you know, and he's going to now start over. And so he comes to the verge again, but Moses talks him off the ledge. In the text, we have an expression of an idea of God. And we've talked about the concept of repentance quite a bit and how our preferred ways to conceptualize of repentance is a new or fresh view of God. And so a lot of times these views are projected upon God when it's actually describing the condition of the human perception rather than the divine perception. And so you can look at this and you say, well, God changed his mind about what he was going to do. Or you could look at it and say, well, the people changed their mind about who they understood God was. Or Moses changed his mind. Moses was upset. Or Moses changed his mind. Exactly. So Moses is projecting all of his angst upon God and having this argument, right? This back and forth. Which is an internal struggle. Sure. It is a little bit similar to what we see, you know, I'm such a Book of Mormon guy. We go to Jacob chapter 5 and we have the allegory of the olive tree. And there's multiple times in there where the Lord of the vineyard says, I'm going to go destroy my vineyard. And the servant says, oh, no, don't destroy your vineyard. Wait a little bit. Let's try to do these things, right? And so he kind of intercedes on behalf of the people. And this is kind of Abraham, I remember, with saying, oh, well, what if there's 50 righteous people? And he negotiates. With the yeah. yeah, it's a good thing we have these reasonable men to reason with God when he's being unreasonable. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Ancient gods could be very unreasonable, completely unpredictable. You never know where you stand with a god. And so the idea is that you always have to keep sacrificing to a god and you have to up it every time because you never know if the sacrifice is going to be accepted and how God is going to view that. And you've got to bargain with them. And, you know, it occurs to me that some of us in our relationship with God may actually see him the same way today. Yeah. It is easy for us to say, oh, the ancient worldview of this. But when we really do some self-introspection, we see that we do like to treat God this way. Too. Yeah. Going all the way back to the beginning of the story, whether you think of today's episode or maybe Exodus as a whole, I think it comes out, though, in chapter 20, right, when we get the Decalogue, that suzerain vassal treaty, right? God's not saying, if you do these things, then I'll be your God. He's saying, I am your God. This is what I've done for you. And now this is what you're going to do. And he teaches you how to live into 
that you already always are redeemed. How to act, how to live that way, how to live so that you stay in the constant remembrance that you are. That you already always are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, what we're looking for here is the, the metanoia, the repentance, right? The change of heart is epistemological. It's not that our metaphysical reality is going to change, right? It's that our perception of reality changes, it alters, such that we see things, we see ourselves, and we see God correctly, and the relationship between us and God, the one that he is establishing here on his terms. And even so, we continue in this narrative with some bizarre, violent things. So like, you know, what comes oh, I next we could is... just end there. Are we so. going <laughs> to skip that? We Let's just skip over this part. <laughs> That's fine. No, we'll deal with it. I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, so Moses comes and he gathers these Levites and he has them go through and kill something like 3,000 people, right? And the idea is that these were the people that were most responsible or had it in their hearts, so to speak, that they were worshiping this other god. Well, they must have been the ones that had trouble drinking the gold solution and water. Right, right. Yeah. I don't think that we have to think that because someone in antiquity thought that God wanted a bunch of people killed, that God wanted a bunch of people killed. I also don't think that we have to think that anybody was killed. Hmm. You know, it, it may sound like, oh, you just dismiss what it says because you don't like it, something like that. And it's actually, you and I, Ben, I think I can speak for both of us. Correct me if I'm wrong. We've been on the journey of understanding the scriptures in this nonviolent way, taking this nonviolent hermeneutic, where again, our frame of reference is the incarnate God in Christ Jesus, inspired by Boyd's cross vision, right? But at the same time, in our own, and it's really Shiloh, you know, he shared it with us, in our own beatitudinal hermeneutic. What is the core teaching of Jesus, and who is Jesus at his core? And then realizing that that is the face of God. That's the beatific vision. And given that vision, does this, what is being said, make sense? And it just doesn't. It doesn't make sense that this is God. This is man, or man's interpretation of God. Something else is going on. Or a story, or something else. And I have to admit, it takes a while to sit with this. You know, I remember so many times talking about nonviolence with people. You always get, what are you going to do when they come after your family? Oh my gosh. Really? It reminds me of lifeboat ethics. I taught ethics for many years as a philosophy professor at university, and I didn't do it that way. A lot of teachers nowadays do. Professors, they teach lifeboat ethics. You know, what if you have this many people, and if you pull the lever, one person dies, and if you don't pull the lever, everybody dies. But we don't live our lives in lifeboats, right? If you're in a lifeboat and you have a situation like that, let the spirit be your guide. That would be my answer. Right. I mean, you cross that bridge when you find it, right? But for me, ethics is how you live your life every day. And so for me, that's not the way to approach getting into this idea. So it's something that you have to try on. I found that I had to try it on and I had to sit with it and had to be with it. And that the more I was willing to open up to the possibility, I wasn't committed. I wasn't fully committed to nonviolence. But as I open up to the possibility of it, it distilled upon my soul. And the possibilities began to open up, and I began to see things, possibilities that I had not previously seen. Things that seemed impossible now seemed possible. And a different way of seeing things, this is a repentance. It's a repentance process. It's a way of coming to see things differently. And again, it's through the vision of Christ, who he is, what he represents, what he taught. Yeah, it's a way of your spiritual eyes being opened. I think of the story of you know washing his eyes and opening him and seeing the spirits of men. And, and just like you said, it's a repentance. It's viewing God differently. And then when you view God differently, it leads to viewing yourself and others differently. And then in the Beatitudinal tradition, when we're pure in heart, then we see God. And so coming to the scriptures with that lens to see God, be pure in heart when you see God, allows us to sit with these things in a different way. We can still wrestle with them, but it doesn't require that we attribute the violence to God. Or justify our own or others, mm -hmm. right? No, you're seeing in a different light. You're seeing the light of God, right? In God's light. And it occurs to me that this process that you mentioned of purification, of emptying, of becoming pure in heart, or, or poor in spirit, same idea, right? 
you're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, but it's very much like what we see here as the people are preparing to ascend to God. They have to be purified. They have to go through the ritual cleansing, and they have to go through the initiatory work that we still perform in the temple. And we talked about that last time, too, how sometimes we sort of, we don't actually skip over it because it has to be done in a certain order, but we're not necessarily going through it step by step. And the temple ceremony used to take a lot longer than it does now. Right. I mean, a lot longer. How much longer was it? Do you know, Ben? Six hours more? Like back before 1990? I mean, back in the early restored church. Yeah. If you did everything start to finish, it was maybe an all day process. It's an ordeal, right? And by the way, as the word of wisdom says that alcohol is for washing the body, washings and anointings were done in whiskey or with whiskey. So in, in the tradition here in Exodus, they're using either blood from the animals and symbolically doing that, or sometimes in this they'll do wine. Yeah, we get a sprinkling of blood by Moses that reminds us of the Passover, right? And we have these, again, these religious festivals that are probably these earlier agricultural festivals that get co-opted in the same way that we as Christians took Yule, which is at winter solstice, and we sort of co-opt that earlier pagan festival, and we move Christmas to that time. And so this is Christmas now. Yeah. They did the same thing. So that shouldn't strike us as odd at all. We did the same thing as Christians. So here in the story, when Moses comes to Aaron and is like, dude, What's up? <laughs> Why did you do this? What's going on? Um, <laughs> this is probably one of the funniest parts in the entire Bible. It reminds me of Adam and Eve. Yeah. Aaron is like, well, I just took all this gold and we put it in the fire and all of a sudden there was a calf. It just came out. You know, I didn't do it on purpose. It just happened. <laughs> yeah. It also reminds me of in Spanish when we use the, the reflexive to give a passive sense, you know, like, it just broke, only here it just came together, you know? It's not I broke it, it broke, you know? Yeah, when I threw all the gold in there, all of a sudden there was a calf, so obviously that was fate, right? This was the will of God, so we're going to do something about it. I didn't mean to make a calf. It, it's just hilarious, you know, the way that he responds. It's almost like a four-year-old or something responding to, okay, well, who broke this? I don't know, you know, just, I was just looking at it and it just broke. <laughs> That's not how it worked. Do you think I'm stupid? I didn't do anything. It wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. So, yeah, this is just really a funny part. Drink some of this gold and water solution and we'll see if it was you. Yeah. I don't really have anything specific to comment on in the last couple chapters. There are some things there if, if there's anything that you want to talk about, Christopher, but nothing that was, I think, as significant as what we've been talking about. No, even if we weren't at an hour and a half, I don't have anything to add other than to say, you know, just look at where we're headed. We are going to go through the rest of Exodus next week, 35 through 40, and we actually go into Leviticus. So we have got to talk then. We've got to talk because if we're yeah. not going to skip any chapters in Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that we necessarily... To, to be decided. Yeah, I mean, we'll read through them. You know, we may not comment on everything in them. You know, it just depends what we mean by skip, right? But we'll definitely read them. But we might have something to say. Yeah, we might have something to say about yeah, it. Yeah, we might have something to say about something in Leviticus that's not in the reading. At minimum, right? At minimum. Yeah, that's good. I just can't. I don't like the idea of skipping chapters. I have a hard time with that. My concern is you're missing some sort of context that then helps you explain yeah. why they're drinking gold water, you know? <laughs> Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this time it didn't help, but <laughs> I can see where if you got to that point, you would have thought, okay, maybe it was in those chapters we skipped and you'd have to go exactly. back and read. Right. Go back. Right. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of the great, tra I think it's the best translation of the, of the Quran for, in terms of the poetic value of having the experience of reading the Quran in English and having the experience that someone would have reading the Arabic in terms of poetic value is Thomas Cleary's. And his translation is out of print. But in print, there's the essential Quran. And I've used the essential Quran for teaching Quran. And people are, are suspicious because, well, oh, did you leave out the bad parts? You know, are you just leaving parts out because you don't want us to know about them? Sanitized version. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I always had to explain, you know, how Thomas Cleary made the selections that he made. And then to have at least one discussion set aside where I would bring up all the things that you might think, you know, stuff that you've read in quote images on Facebook, you know, that are taken out of context or ask me anything. Right. 
So we'll read the chapters so you don't have to. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, as always, thanks so much to the editors, Kyle Swingle and Tom Bogle. Thanks to Lindsay and Shiloh for all the work they do on this, making it possible. As Christopher was saying, these were some of the most difficult chapters we've come across so far in the Old Testament. It might not get easier from here, <laughs> but in any case, after chewing on this for a while and having some good discussions and reading commentary, I was able to come away with some I think, very useful things for myself. So Yeah, we hope you do too. So until next time, I'm Ben Peterson. I'm Christopher Hurtado. Thanks.